Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today is another bite-sized episode and it is a question from a lovely listener. So my listener has asked, I wonder if you could cover the topic of counting, tracking, calories slash food. I was once told by my therapist that it was a positive thing to count calories and it has stuck with me. And I've been doing some sort of mental arithmetic on my food since my early teens and really struggle not to do it. It makes me feel in control as I still do have a fear of gaining weight and don't feel totally happy with where my body is right now. But I'm really trying to accept that maybe it's at my body's set point. Okay, so a fantastic topic. I know this is something that many, many people struggle with. And if you are tracking or counting calories, it can take up volumes of your headspace daily. And I always think, this headspace could be filled with many more joyful and uplifting thoughts than food and particularly tracking food. So before I launch into this, I want to say that counting or tracking is not a black and white good and bad habit. For some people in eating disorder recovery, in the early days of recovery, tracking can be beneficial to make sure that you're eating enough I'm not saying it's absolutely necessary, but for some people, I know some of my clients have found tracking helpful as a way to make sure they're really getting all their food in. It can also, as well, if you don't know much about nutrition, it can provide you with education about nutritional content of foods, and it can offer some structure and safety as you begin to improve your relationship with food. Also, I guess I'd say as well, along the theme of things not being black and white around tracking obviously if something like a bodybuilder or similar you probably have to track your intake of food on some level to gain the aesthetic that you're after however I guess for most bodybuilders if they're doing this in a healthy way this shouldn't be like an obsessive and ongoing preoccupation rather someone who's in a healthy relationship in all of that would be kind of going through phases of bulking and cutting And it wouldn't become something that's obsessive. But back to eating disorder recovery, I personally believe that for full wholehearted recovery, that tracking is something you don't want to be doing day by day for the rest of your life. And I would say that it's pretty impossible to have a relaxed relationship with food and your body when you're constantly doing the mental arithmetic and adding up numbers in your head. So I guess just as a bit of motivation initially is just to think about all the headspace that you could have freed up if you're thinking about other things. Things like holidays or trips, your passions, your loves, your relationships. It could free up a lot of space. So I'm going to talk about five ways to change your relationship with tracking food and counting calories. So number one, thinking about the pros and cons of the habit. So if you listen to this podcast, you will know that I often advocate the pros and cons exercise when you're looking at different behaviours. So as with many of these behaviours, before you launch into changing something, it's really helpful to work on your motivation for change rather than going straight in there. So think about for yourself, what are your personal pros and cons of tracking? What are you really gaining from this behaviour? Is it controlling your weight? Is it just feeling safe? Is it filling a void maybe? You know, would you have so much free time you wouldn't know what to be thinking about? Is it just a habit that you've got into? But I guess it's trying to just notice the benefits and think about how important are these really to you? Because if you are getting a lot of benefits, and I'm putting benefits in kind of air quotes here because of um, they might not, not necessarily be really productive benefits. They may be maladaptive benefits. Um, but I think what it's helpful for you to think about is actually am I getting something from this behaviour? What is it really doing for me? Because unless you can really acknowledge that, it's probably going to be a major block for change. Also, very importantly, write out your list of cons. What are the negative aspects of having to track or count calories? And hopefully you will have several cons that help you perhaps appreciate how weary and exhausting calorie counting could make you feel. 
And I think what I find with a lot of clients who do track is they often express feelings of never being good enough or failing when trying to keep within a certain limit or to keep to a certain number. It's also really hard to tune into your hunger properly um, because you're also rely, always relying on external cues of how much more you're allowed to eat or not eat that day rather than being able to listen to your body. Also as well, you can miss out on social events. You might not want to eat at a particular restaurant or something because you're really worried about your kind of balance of macros or the calories in a certain dish. Um, you could feel really, really anxious. You could just be really preoccupied and it's really hard to live in the moment. So I think it's really important to think about your own personal cons. What are the costs to you of tracking and counting calories? Because if you don't engage with the costs and really identify what those might be, then again, it might be quite tricky to change because sometimes we have to almost put our cards on the table, take that bird's eye kind of zoom out view of what we're doing in our lives to really evaluate, is this serving me or not? So yeah, that's the first step. So once you've done the exercise, I mean, I guess you might decide, well, there's so many positives for tracking, I want to keep doing it. But hopefully you will find actually there's quite a lot of cons here and maybe I don't want to be doing it. So it gives you that kind of zoom out, that different perspective. So the next next point, number two, is thinking about your weight and your worth and body image stuff all going on because this is often a real barrier to change. So when your weight is your worth. So what's very likely for you, I would imagine if you've done your pros and cons list, that one of your pros is that you feel that you're controlling your body, your body weight, your shape, your size. So you might think that tracking is working for you as you're keeping your body maybe below your set point or at a place where your body is not truly happy, but where you feel that you should be. And Calorie counting or tracking might be keeping you in a place that feels very safe and where you can feel a bit more accepting of your body. Now, I think, again, when you're placing so much worth on your weight being in a certain place, it's really, really, really hard to win. You know, I think for most people I work with, they will have a sort of almost honeymoon period or a period of time where they felt that everything was going really, really well with this and they were... Um, a certain weight and shape that they felt more happy with but it probably wasn't a sustainable place for them so then they're feeling perpetually dissatisfied because they're not back at that place Um, so there's a constant feeling of failure um, constant feeling of not being good enough and also when you're in that place of feeling like you failed or not good enough you're highly vulnerable then as well to self-sabotage and binging or overeating because of Say if you go over your calorie limit or you get your sort of tracking um, goals wrong, then you might just think, oh, well, I've completely blown it. I might as well just eat everything in sight. And, um, you know, you completely self-sabotage. So in fact, <laughs> you know, in a way, the, the goal that you're trying to achieve kind of gets thrown out the window and actually your relationship with food becomes even worse. So over-evaluation of shape or weight as a measure of self-worth is a real problem and it's often at the root, well, as part of the root of the eating disorder. When you primarily focus on weight goals or body aesthetics as a way to feel good about yourself, your self-worth then obviously becomes linked to your ability to achieve these goals. So your ability to follow a diet, achieve a number on the scales, will become um, something that you really focus on in a way to feel good enough and then if you don't achieve that, you will not feel good at all. So the person that doesn't have an eating disorder will hopefully be getting their self-worth from a whole range of things, things like their relationships, their job, their family, their hobbies, their spirituality, maybe a whole range of things. But if you have an eating disorder, you've probably reduced your worth very much to focusing on your ability to control your food and your ability to control your body. And um, yeah, this is just really, really hard to win at. So you might just want to think, first of all, to about drawing out your own self-worth pie chart. So think about the moment, if you were to draw it out, 
Where do you think you're getting your self-worth from? How much is from food? How much is from body? How much is from your relationships? How much is from your hobbies? How much is from your work? How much is down to your friendships? How much is down to your spirituality, if that's important to you? How much is down to other things? And just draw out your pie chart and just notice, is this in line with your values? Are you happy with the way your pie chart looks at the moment? And if you're not, just think about how would you like it to look? How would you like the different segments to be divided up? What would you like food and body image to look like within your pie chart? And also just to see that it's really, really hard to win, isn't it? When you are putting so much value on your weight and shape as a way to feel good enough, because it's really, really hard. Because even if you achieve the magical goal, whatever that is, it's probably always going to be someone else coming along who's a bit leaner, a bit thinner, got a better physique, a bit younger, and you're going to feel threatened and you're going to not feel good enough. So it's so, so, so hard to win. So what also starts to happen is when you're chasing control of food or control of your weight or being a certain dress size as your primary evaluators of self-worth, it tends to encourage eating disorder behaviours because what it results in is you being very restrictive with your eating or maybe fasting or maybe missing meals or limiting your intake in some way. And this is usually just uh, usually sustainable for a certain time period, but then it becomes unsustainable and you end up overeating, binge eating and yeah, you get into very disordered eating patterns, then you might feel the need to overexercise or purge or do chewing and spitting, and it just becomes a not very nice cycle. And life becomes as well more restricted and narrow because you start being preoccupied with food all the time, and this just becomes such an intense preoccupation. And it prevents you living your life and engaging in a wide range of activities, interests, or relationships that could improve life quality. Because of if you want to be very restrictive with your food, you have to be like really like disciplined and hyper focused. You have to be cold some of the time. You have to have poor concentration often. It's really hard to have energy for relationships. It's really hard to have energy to engage in the things that you would have done before you got into this. And the focus gets really drilled down to your ability to adhere to your plan. And it's really, really hard to win at this consistently. You're life becomes very, very narrow as a way to try and win at this. So Dr. Christopher Fairburn, you may have heard me talk about him before. Actually, I believe he's Professor Christopher Fairburn now. He talks about viewing the world through your eating problem sunglasses when you're in this place. And he says that we all have a slightly distorted view of reality. You know, we all do. But if you have an eating disorder, you are wearing your eating disorder sunglasses in determining your worth. So if you're going around with your eating disorder sunglasses on, you notice the size, the shape and body of others, especially those who are thinner or leaner than you. You strive for the perfect diet. You can be overly restricted with eating. And you spend an abnormal amount of time thinking about food. You're constantly aware of small changes in your body. And you tend to be extremely critical of yourself when not conforming to the rules you've set yourself. But Fairburn says you can take your sunglasses off and look at the world in a different way. Now, of course, that sounds like really simple, but of course, it is really, really hard if you've been viewing the world through this lens. However, through Fairburn's work, it's helpful to realise that you can begin to adopt a different perspective. You can begin to dilute the eating disorder thoughts. And by considering that there may be a different viewpoint, this can open the door to the possibility of change. So this is hard and difficult work. And if your worth is tangled up tightly in your body shape and size, if you let go of this, you might be really, really, really terrified because you might just feel that you're not good enough, that you're not worthy, etc., etc. So this is challenging, but I would just say to you as well, what's so important for all of us in eating disorder recovery is that we do develop radical acceptance that the body that we do have. And I know that is really, really hard. You know, we do live in a society where for some people this is going to be much easier for others. If you have sort of thin privilege and your body is naturally at a smaller size, a lower weight, 
with you sort of eating what I would just say more normally, and I'm putting that inverted commas in um, because of what is normal eating exactly. You know, everyone has an individual relationship with food. But of course, this can be harder, you know, in the society we live in, if you are taller, if you are larger boned, if you hold more muscle, if you are a larger build, it is harder to live in our society and you will face more judgment and you will find it more challenging probably to feel really accepted. However, it's so, so important for all of us that we do have a radical acceptance of the body we have. You know, I think about 70 to 80% of our body shape is determined by our genetics. We are led to believe that we can just sculpt our body into any shape and size with the right diet and the right workout. And that is not true. You know, we're already individual. And I think for myself, um, you know, as I've said on this podcast before, I am quite pear shaped. <laughs> so I do hold more weight on my bottom and thighs and I don't hold as much weight on my top half and that's just the way I am in the same way that I have size six and a half feet and the same way that I have curly hair and the same way that I have blue eyes. These are certain things about my body that I can't change and actually in my own healing having a radical acceptance of the body that I have has been really really crucial and I had a period before I was in a bulimic phase where I had anorexia nervosa and I did hold my weight um, significantly lower than where it is today. And to heal, I had to go through a weight restoration journey. And that was something that was difficult to adjust to at the time. However, I would say that allowing my body to be at its healthy place, at its set point, means now I have energy, I have concentration, I have lust for life, I have good relationships, I have so many things in my life now that I can engage with wholeheartedly. Whereas I can remember, you know, when I was restricting, I had so little energy, I was tired all the time. I had this kind of yawn thing in my throat that um would just kind of constantly be there. I was found it really hard to like listen to conversations I found it really hard to do my studies or revise I was constantly preoccupied by food all the time I felt faint I felt dizzy and I remember when I was starting to eat again and starting to restore weight although it was very challenging to restore weight the actual relief I felt from fueling my body and not feeling so starved and preoccupied with food was incredible. And I can still remember, I might have said this before on this podcast, but I can remember having cheese on toast at my mum and dad's house. Um, you know, like two, two or three good slices of cheese on toast and like with lots of layers of cheese and properly melted. And then I think I had like a Kit Kat or something for pudding. <laughs> and, um, it was the first time I'd allowed myself to eat those kind of foods for a long time. And I just remember feeling so much peace and freedom just to be able to eat and not be starving and constantly hungry. So this stuff is hard, but it's part of the journey to have some radical acceptance of the body that you are in, to move towards body acceptance for the body that you're in. Because otherwise, if you can't do that or if you you know you're not ready to do that yet it's going to be really more challenging to give up tracking or counting calories because if you're going to be holding on to trying to keep your body in a place where it's probably not really genuinely happy without a strict level of control so I think as well, what really helps me with some of this sometimes is to like really do a zoom out and to think about, okay, when I'm 90, looking back at my life, what's going to be really important to me? Am I going to think, oh, I'm so glad that I restricted my intake for so long and I was so skinny? No, I'm going to be looking back at my life when I'm 90, please God, <laughs> and thinking, oh, I'm so glad that I was able to help people. I'm so glad that I was able to travel to that place. I'm so glad that I was able to have like really meaningful relationships. I'm so glad I was able to have fun and get out there and truly, truly live my life in a fully flourishing way. That is what is going to be important. So this is challenging. I know it is, but start to work towards more radical acceptance of your body. And I promise you as well, 
the thought of this is often far worse than actually doing it. You know, I think we often think about weight gain as being the most terrifying, worst thing that could possibly happen. Actually, it's not that bad, I promise you. Okay, so for you, if the body image bit feels super, super challenging, it's really helpful to think about number three, which is unrooting the unhelpful beliefs that might be below this. So underneath your desire to be thin, to be lean, to be accepted, to feel good enough, is probably or are probably some deep-rooted beliefs where for whatever reason you don't feel lovable, you don't feel good enough, you don't feel worthy. And I guess, you know, when you first came into the world as a little baby, you weren't born feeling like this, you know, and you came into the world as a baby, you would have just brought your whole self, your fully flourishing self, you would have cried when you needed food or sleep. You wouldn't have had all that sort of social conditioning where you feel that you have to be a certain way to be accepted. But of course, we kind of grow up in the world where you have a lot of pressure from diet culture, all the expectations that are placed on us. We grow up in families sometimes where even if we're loved, we don't get our needs met. Or we might have grown up in a family where we received a lot of abuse or criticism or we um, went through traumatic experiences or losses. You know, there might have been things that really impacted your self-worth and for whatever reason it has resulted in you not feeling good enough. And then, of course, what is very seductive in our culture as a way of feeling good enough is to change your body, you know, to try and fit in, to try and gain acceptance, to be thinner, to be leaner, to control your food and you know, sadly, sometimes as well, in the least in the shorter term, it often works, you know, we can go from a place perhaps of feeling that we had, we we're not accepted, and then we lose weight, and we get a lot of validation and acceptance. And even if we're struggling with disordered eating, because of the world really praises this, it can feel like it's the right thing to do. So if you recognise that deep down, you don't feel good enough, um, realise that, you know, perhaps you've got some deeper work to do around your self-worth. And I guess just what's really helpful to say out loud as well is, even if you were as thin or as lean as you feel you need to be, it's probably not going to bring you the self-worth and acceptance you desire. In fact, it's probably going to make things worse because of if you're starving um, or over-exercising or engaging in disordered eating behaviours, you're not going to feel very good physically or mentally. So if you recognise that you don't feel good enough, think about your early life. Think about what have been some of the key influences and perhaps particularly as well around body image. You know, what was your mum and dad's relationship with food and body image like? How did people talk about bodies in the family? Did you have any siblings? Were people kind of labelled in certain ways? And what about kind of grandparents, aunts and uncles, wider family? Have a think about all these different influences. And then, of course, as well, you were probably influenced at school. You know, maybe as well, you might have experienced bullying about your appearance. Maybe you experienced bullying just more generally. And these, this bullying obviously would understandably not make you feel good enough, would probably make you feel quite unworthy. So it's really helpful just to recognise where are the roots of my not good enoughness. And can you begin to offer yourself more kindness and self-compassion? And if this feels really impossible, or when you think about your childhood, it just feels really overwhelming and difficult to even go there, you know, you might want to think about having therapy to support you with some of this, because maybe, you know, you do need the support and a sort of safe container almost of therapy where you can begin to open up bit by bit and to explore some of this because of you know sometimes it is quite hard to do this on our own so I think again this is really 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 important because I've never met I don't think anyone with an eating disorder who has really good rock solid self-esteem because of if you have good self-esteem you are not going to want to punish your body through starving through other eating disorder behaviours. You might want to take care of your body. You know, if you've got good self-esteem, you might want to take care of your body. You might want to nourish it. it. You might want to value health. You might want to 
move your body to make it feel good, but you will also really value your mental and physical well-being. Whereas when you have an eating disorder, you go into a destructive zone where actually you're starting to do yourself more harm, even though maybe that wasn't the intention. You know, it might have started off as a health kick or something. So it's really important to start to try and understand the roots and to recognise, you know, many, many human beings don't feel good enough. And the good thing is we can start to change this. We can start to understand this. We can start to reevaluate our past. And often we're holding on to messages from people that we were given, you know, when we were really, really young. And often perhaps as well, people's opinions who, when we really look at it in the cold light of day and we are zooming out, we realise that some of these messages that we were given were perhaps passed on when an adult, a significant adult in your life was in quite a troubled place or they're sort of projecting their own unhappiness and their own kind of critical thoughts onto you. You know, and I think trying to be compassionate as well for older generations. I think, you know, back in the day, there was no support for mental health. Being psychologically aware was not really a thing. People were surviving. I think many of our parents and grandparents have experienced real traumas in their life that they never got help for. So people are operating from the best place that they can, but often with limited psychological awareness and perspective. So they're often like leaking all their unresolved stuff all over the next generation, you know, leaking it out with the best will in the world and quite unconsciously. But when you can start to really understand this, you can have more distance from it and you can begin to realise actually some of these things that I've been told I don't have to absorb, I don't have to take on board, I can actually begin to question these things and actually I can begin to be like a good friend to myself, I can be kind and compassionate to myself, I can think about how I would speak to a younger version of myself, I can think about how would I speak to a friend in this situation? I can just bring so much more love and support and kindness towards myself. Because often if we're living with an eating disorder, the underlying kind of voice in terms of how we kind of parent and talk to ourselves is very critical, very punishing and very, very unkind. And um, if you've got an eating disorder, you're probably an extremely compassionate, empathetic person who is great at caring for others but you're not so good at doing it for yourself. However, this is something you can learn. It's something I have definitely learned to do towards myself. I was extremely self-critical, particularly in my late teens and through into my 20s. I was extremely critical, extremely punishing of myself. And I really would say at certain points that my self-worth was absolutely on the floor. I really had incredibly low self-worth and this had such an impact on my life in such a massive way and particularly when I look back in terms of my relationships, you know, I wasn't able to set boundaries or say no, I was a chronic people pleaser and I got myself into all kinds of difficult situations because of this and it was a perpetuating cycle which fed my low self-worth even more an eating disorder was definitely a coping strategy to manage all those feelings that I wasn't able to express, that I didn't feel I had permission to express. So I feel I've waffled on there and gone a bit off point, but I think you're getting to my, pretty get my message, it's really good to look at the core issues and to explore our past, understand the core beliefs under the eating disorder which are holding us back. Okay, so my next step, tip even. (laughs) Number four is work to stop tracking. So you might be using my fitness pal, maybe you're looking at calories on labels. And now of course as well, we have the lovely joy of having to deal with calories on menus. So we are bombarded from all angles. So work to stop tracking or at least reduce it and you might need to do it in baby steps. So maybe start with not tracking one or measuring out one meal. And this is going to be hard because to begin with, your brain is going to have an encyclopedic knowledge of calorie information anyway. So it's going to take time. So even if you're not like looking it up, your brain probably knows it anyway. But what's really helpful is to realise that you do have some control of your environment. You do have some control of your thoughts. So 
the first thing is even just to be aware of if you are having lots of thoughts about calories, just be observant of them. Just notice them. Just think, oh, there I go again. I'm about to eat a banana. I'm thinking about how many calories are in the banana. And I guess previously, when you were in the depths of your tracking, that might have led you down a rabbit hole of calculating how many banana calories you're about to eat, like thinking about then what you're going to eat later in the day and, you know, doing all these mental arithmetic things in your head. But the first step is just to notice, aha, I have just thought about how many calories there are on a banana. Okay, let's try and think about something else. Let's maybe distract myself. Let's just think, actually, we're not going to think about calories anymore. Let's try and think about, you know, let's try and think about cats or let's divert our attention. Now, this is going to be quite tricky to begin with because of it's almost a bit like that thing where you say, right, don't think about a pink elephant. And then, of course, now I've just said that to you, all you're going to be able to think about is a great big pink elephant, you know, and you'll probably just see it really vividly and it'll be like bright, fluorescent pink and um, standing in the corner of the room. And of course, when you have the thought, oh, I don't want to think about galleries, you're going to be thinking about it more. But I guess you just have to like do a bit of a drip drip process with this. So, for example, if you're not inputting the calories onto my fitness pal, if you're not like scrutinizing labels, you're already starting to dilute the calorie talk a bit, which is really, really helpful. So it's you just got to think a bit as, of it as like a baby step process of almost like diluting the calorie chatter bit by bit. And kind of using a bit of cognitive behavior therapy, realizing that our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviours and our physical body are all interlinked. So say, for example, if you do the behaviour of looking at a food label, you know, just imagine if you're doing that multiple times per day, that is going to lead to a thought around calories and food. That is going to lead to a behaviour, say, to reduce your intake or feel that you've got to go and burn off a certain number of calories It's probably going to affect how you feel in your body as well. You know, if you think you've eaten too many calories, you might feel bigger, Um, even though objectively it's not kind of true. You might really feel that and you might feel like your skin's crawling or your stomach's bloated. So starting to realise the links between all of these, you know, our thoughts, feelings, behaviour and physical body can be really, really powerful. Because if you just think about say on a typical day at the moment, you're looking at labels, I don't know, once an hour or something. Just imagine even if you reduce that to looking at label, food labels, three times a day or something compared to once an hour. Now that is going to have an impact on your thoughts and feelings and behaviour and how you feel in your physical body. Okay, so you've got to just do this bit by bit. You can't sadly just turn off a switch in your head that can just turn off all that calorie nonsense once and for all. But you can start to like dilute it slowly. And I guess as well, another way to think about this is um, if you think back to a time in your life, maybe where you were really into something. Um, I could just give you an example in my life, which is quite funny, actually, thinking back to it. But when I was 16, I had this rock, like heavy metal rock boyfriend. And I'd never been into heavy metal before, but he massively influenced me. And, you know, it's my first love. So it's all very exciting. And, um, you know, I he did introduce me to heavy metal, actually, and I still quite enjoy some of it to this day. But at that time, before I met him, I'd never listened to heavy metal before. I'd never, like, watched Raw Power, which used to be like this thing that was on in the middle of the night. <laughs> just shows how old I am, <laughs> television program. And I used to, um, and I, and then I, and then I had never like read magazines about rock, etc. Anyway, so when I started going out with this boyfriend, um, I really wanted to kind of be, you know, impress him and be able to have conversations with him about all this music. So I would, um, you know, start to watch the um, program in the middle of the night, I would start to listen to more music, I would start to read the magazines, I was kind of exposing myself to all of that information, you know, much more over the course of my week. And in response to that, it affected like how I would think about the music, it, exp- it affected how I felt, it affected my kind of behaviours, you know, because of I was exposing myself in a different, exposing myself to a different environment. Okay. And I guess this can apply to anything, you know, like if you have 
never been horse riding and then you suddenly get into horse riding and then you suddenly start reading up on horse riding and getting all the equipment and going to the local stables and having lessons every week, you'll suddenly start to have a lot more thoughts around horses and horse riding and all those things. So I don't know if I'm making good sense here, but I suppose what I wanted to say to you is like at the moment, if you're absorbed in calorie tracking world, you're probably doing lots of things that are fueling that fire. You know, you're going on the MyFitnessPal app, you're doing all these things that in a way, are making you think about all of this even more. So if you want to reduce it, you do have some control of that. You can start to like dilute that environment. You can start to think about what you expose yourself to. And you can think about maybe, you know, instead of like looking at my fitness pal, maybe you could be looking on another app that's totally unrelated, that's about something else that really interests you. You can maybe like read a book, you can maybe listen to music, you know, you might have to find something to replace it with to start with. OK, and just really engage in the long game as well. You might think, oh, my God, I can never get all this calorie information out of my head. But actually, if you think about working on this bit by bit over the next year, as I'm always saying, as C.S. Lewis says, actually, day by day, it seems as though nothing changes. But when you look back, everything is different. Such a great quote. I really, really love that. So hold that in mind, you know, think about actually engage in the long game, do the baby steps, you can start to dilute some of this. And um, in the same way that once upon a time, I was massively into heavy metal and massively thinking about that many times of the week. Now today, I might think about it when a song comes on the radio, or, you know, maybe if I'm listening to something on my Spotify playlist, but it's not something I'm really thinking about day by day, hour by hour, as I probably was when I was 16. So there you go. Hope that helps you a bit with that. Um, and another thing, I guess, as well, in terms of um, when you're working to stop tracking as well, you can start to tune in more to your hunger and fullness cues because your body has all the wisdom within to, you know, actually tell you if you're hungry rather than an app telling you if you're hungry and if you've eaten enough or not enough. Um, you know, your body is this powerhouse of wisdom in the same way that it can tell you when to breathe or when you need the toilet. It can also tell you when you are hungry and full. And if you feel that you're just way off with this at the moment, first thing to do as well with this is just start to establish a bit of routine, a bit of regular eating. This will all really help um, because of sometimes if you've had an eating disorder for a long time, your body is just so out of sync. You need to kind of give it a bit of help to get back into the flow and to sort of stimulate all those um, signs and signals again. Okay. Gosh, I'm just realising this is meant to be a bite-sized episode and I am really going on a bit here. Okay, so my um, point number five is about really embedding positive beliefs in trusting your body. And this is something I have worked really hard on this to really embed into my unconscious a knowing and a real belief that I can trust my body. Now, I know something that's really helped me with this is that I did in my childhood have a very food neutral relationship and also a body image neutrality as well. So I ate everything freely. I was also active. You know, I literally did eat roast dinners, fish and chips, chocolate, everything unrestricted. I was also quite active. I grew up on a farm. And my body, you know, served me well with energy and movement. I felt good. I never really thought about my body. I was in a very neutral place. And I felt really, I lived without guilt and felt peace. You know, it was a really positive frame of reference when I think back on it. Now, I know for some, for some people listening to this, you may have never had a time where you have had that. And um, I send you a lot of empathy there because I think it is harder if you've never, never had a peaceful relationship with your body. It can be hard to just fathom what that is like. So I truly appreciate that um, it, this, ma this makes this part more difficult. So for my own journey, I always thought that my ultimate goal was to return to that kind of body neutrality, that food neutrality after my eating disorder. So I always wanted 
full and what I'd call flourishing recovery. I didn't want to have that kind of quasi stuck somewhere in the middle, still being bogged down with food rules and restrictions. Because I think sometimes that's the worst place to be in because of, in a way, you kind of look as though you've recovered to the outside world, but mentally you're still struggling so much. And it's a really, really lonely, lonely place because people just don't get it. They just think everything's fine, but you're in your own head really, really struggling and you're not in a peaceful place and you still have all that food preoccupation, etc. So the th- kind of things that I have really embedded deep into my psyche and I now truly believe are statements like this. So things like, I trust my body to tell me what it needs. Okay, so I really have that deep seated trust. You know, if I'm really wanting chocolate, I'm having some chocolate. If I'm really wanting broccoli, I'm having some broccoli. If I am hungry and it's only an hour after breakfast, I need more food. If I am sleep deprived and I'm craving sugar, I allow my body to have it. You know, I'm very much in a place where I trust my body to tell me what it needs. And I I believe I can trust it and listen to it. And my body is going to give me the answers. It's going to give me the wisdom. Another belief that I have really embedded as well is I have a high metabolism and I can eat whatever I want. Okay. Now this for me as well, whether it's true or not, you know, I think with our beliefs, um, you know, whatever we believe becomes our truth, really, because of ultimately thoughts aren't facts, but we tend to believe our thoughts. So if you're going to believe thoughts, you might as well believe some thoughts that are helpful. So the fact that I believe that I have a high metabolism and I can eat whatever I want, it means that I never feel guilty for eating. And I always distrust. Well, even if I ate, I don't know, half a cake, <laughs> it's not something I'll probably do very often. But I really believe, you know, my body can deal with this. I have a high metabolism. I can eat whatever I want. So I don't feel guilty. I just trust my body. It's all going to work out. Another belief I I say to myself, or another statement I say to myself is, I allow myself to enjoy all the foods. So I really do give myself genuine permission. I don't feel guilty. I say to myself as well, food is to be enjoyed and is one of life's pleasures. Like I really associate with eating the cake, eating the fish and chips on the beach, having the pizza out with my children. I think I am living my best life. I am enjoying myself. I am out there living my life. I'm not sat at home depriving myself and feeling miserable. So I really associate enjoying all the foods with freedom, spontaneity, adventure, socializing, fun, playfulness, leading my best life. I very much associate with all those things. I would not be thinking I feel guilty, anxious, um, shame, whatever other feelings might come up. I might think as well, I love to eat and experience all the tastes and textures. You know, I just think bring it on, bring on variety. Really nice to enjoy a whole range of things. And I'm just thinking back, we're just um, coming out of the Easter holiday um, in the UK at the moment. And, um, you know, if I was tracking all the food I've eaten over the last couple of weeks, um, I have definitely eaten a lot more chocolate, um, a lot more rich foods. I've eaten out a lot more than I would do normally when I'm in my sort of usual working routine. Um, But it's okay. Do you know what I mean? I've had a really lovely Easter, um, you know, everything still fits. (laughs) Um, I feel good. It's all part of life and the process and having that deep seated belief and trust in my body. Okay. And I'll probably just give you another example of today of just really leaning into the trust of my body. Um, Today I had my breakfast. I then was quite hungry again about 10. So then I had another kind of second breakfast Um, And then I went to the gym in the middle of the day and um, met up with a friend. And then I kind of came back and I was really quite hungry about half three. So I had another kind of um, meal then. And then when it came to sort of dinner time with my children, I was thinking, okay, I need to eat something because I need to fuel my body. But I was thinking I'm not quite as hungry as usual. So I just adjusted it. You know, I wasn't depriving myself, but I just very much ate to my hunger and fullness. 
And I very much just trusted that my body is telling me um, what it needs. You know, it's telling me, it's, it's just like giving me the signal so I can kind of trust that. So because of that, because I'd probably eaten more during the day, I just wasn't quite so hungry in the evening. Now, it wasn't at all about thinking I need to eat less because I've eaten more in the earlier in the day. If I had had my normal appetite at dinner, I would have just eaten the same size dinner that I would normally eat. Again, it's just very much going with that self-trust and trusting my body. So I think, again, it's really, really helpful to embed some of these beliefs and just to have a kind of deep knowing in a way that your body is going to be okay. And I think what really helped me to build some of this self-trust is when I was recovering from bulimia, I got to a stage where I wasn't purging, but I would still binge on occasions. And um, on several occasions, I had to live with the fact sometimes that I'd had a massive binge, you know, eaten huge volumes of food. And my stomach was absolutely distended. I really wanted to purge, but I knew I couldn't do that because it would open the door to all kinds of horrible kind of pathways that I did not want to go down again. So I had to sit with it. And I remember just the experience of living through binging and just sitting with it and realising actually nothing that bad really happened (laughs) was okay. You know, I I kind of, even if I had a massive binge, what's the worst that can happen? Maybe I'm going to put on two pounds? Probably, I mean, not that I was even really weighing myself, but I'm just trying to look look at it in a more zoom out perspective. A lot of that as well would probably be just be um, gaining a lot of water, do you know what I mean? It's like looking at things in perspective and also realising, you know, probably as well, if you'd had a big binge, I don't know, you're probably not going to be, if you're back into then being more in touch with your body the next day, absolutely you shouldn't be restricting, but you may not be quite so hungry that next day. Again, it's getting back into your hunger and fullness cues and just trusting that your body can cope with things. And that for me, kind of living through some of those overeating episodes and realising actually nothing that bad happened Um, really helped me to build that self-trust. And I think, again, just over time, just being really flexible with my eating, just leaning in to all the things that I want to do, not restricting myself in any way, and then just kind of realising that actually nothing bad happens. I don't need to massively control my body to be okay is incredibly liberating. And the more that you can let go of the control and lean into the self-trust, it's like this perpetuating cycle like a snowball that's gathering momentum and getting larger and then the self-trust snowball grows and grows and grows and you start to really feel like yeah I can trust myself not just with food not just with body but I can trust myself in life and that is a great feeling and I want to give you all hope because there have been times where I did not feel like that at all I could not have been further from that place But today, I absolutely lean into self-trust 100%. So I'm sorry this isn't really a bite-sized episode. It's ended up being quite long, but hopefully you've got some value from this. So in summary, if you want to reduce your tracking, reduce your macro counting, etc., the things to do are work on your pros and cons, really try and understand like what you're gaining from this, what you're losing from this, do that kind of zoom out, think of the bigger picture, recognise if you're using maladaptive coping strategies, really get motivated to change before you step into the place of taking action. Number two, really work on that radical body acceptance. If your weight and your worth are so intrinsically linked, it's impossible to win. It's really, really hard to feel good enough. So radical acceptance of the body in the same way that you have radical acceptance of your hair length, of your shoe size, you want to be moving towards this for your body. Number three, if that is really, really tricky for you, as it is for many of us, work on your deeper beliefs. What is underneath? Why are you not feeling good enough? What is at the core of this? Number five, work to stop tracking. So maybe delete my fitness pal, whatever app you're using. Stop looking at labels, try and just look at calories on the menus. I know this is all hard. Do it in baby steps though. You might have to start one meal at a time. You might want to work on one area first, but realise again, engage in the long game, change is really possible. And the last one is start to really embed some of these positive statements about having food freedom, about being relaxed around food, around allowing yourself food for pleasure. Allow 
allowing yourself in a way to believe that you can lean into your self-trust and that your body can take care of you. Okay, it's powerful stuff when you can really start to get some roots into your unconscious. Okay, so I hope you have found this episode helpful. If you're not following me already on Instagram, do seek me out at the eating disorder therapist underscore. Now, I am actually trying to post a bit more on Instagram at the moment. Some of you will probably realise I used to have an old account and it got hacked and then I had to start again and I used to sort of love Instagram and then since I got hacked and started again, it's hard work trying to build an account again from scratch. And um, Instagram has changed a lot. Like I built my account a lot about five years ago when there weren't as many people on Instagram and it was probably easier to gain a bit of traction. Whereas now I feel like Instagram is swamped with loads of great content, but it's it's harder to kind of get traction again. So I'm starting again, started again last summer, but I'm really trying, particularly over the Easter holiday, I've had a bit more oomph to post a bit more. And that has been quite fun, actually. I've got a bit more back in touch with my creativity again. And I would like to continue that. But Once I'm back seeing clients again next week, that might all go out the window, but that is my intention. (laughs) So what else to say? I really appreciate your reviews about this podcast and thank you as well just for the many messages that I get in my Instagram DMs and also by email just to say how much you like the podcast and how helpful you're finding it. I appreciate your comments so much and it's still slightly mind-blowing that it is reaching so many people all over the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. What else to say? My online course is still available and has 50% off at the moment. If you want to get a real taste and insight into working with me, if you go to the eatingdisordertherapist.co.uk, you can find out more there. One-to-one work, I have quite a long waiting list just to kind of give you the heads up on that. So if you do want to work with me, there is probably going to be a bit of a wait. But if you want to find out more information about that, you can always message me. What else to mention? I am hosting an event in Camden, London, Saturday, September the 30th, 2023, bringing together a whole load of different professionals that work in the field to really do a deep dive into prevention of eating disorders and body image issues. At the moment, It is planned to be just face-to-face and UK. However, we may actually do an online version as well for all of you listeners in the US if that's something you're really interested in. So if you are, do send me a DM on Instagram about that. Okay, thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.